Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I'm so excited to have one of my most favorite past guests on today. Hi, Carol. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Dr. Carol Kircho is an awesome researcher, scientist, clinical embryologist. And why don't you just tell us more about yourself, Carol? Sure. So I have a PhD in reproduction and I'm a senior clinical embryologist. I have a board certification uh, in the technical supervision of embryology, and I am also an app developer. So I have an app for IVF labs to help doctors and patients communicate better and be on the same page with uh, respect to all the metrics of their cycle. For people who are listening, what's the name of the app if they want to download it and learn from it? It's called ART Compass. A-R-T Compass. Okay. And then can people follow you on Instagram as well? They can on Instagram. We're A-R-T Compass IVF. Awesome. Okay. Well, today's topic, and there's no better person to talk to us about this, is how to pick the best IVF lab. So thank you for being our expert today. So how about labs? Are there lab differences? Yeah, it's such a great question. So I think I love talking to the patients about our IVF lab and the high quality of it and how to pick a great IVF lab. I think, you know, there's so much anxiety leading up to a retrieval, so much work for the patient to do. And then they go in and they get put under and our gametes go behind closed doors, literally. There are usually no windows in an IVF lab. And it's a very controlled environment. And it can kind of feel like a black box, like, my sperm and eggs have gone behind these closed doors. Now what's happening? And I think picking a good IVF lab really boils down to three things. The training and experience of the staff, as well as the volume of the practice, the technology, and that can include everything from software to incubators. And we'll talk a little bit about each and the certification of the lab through one of our professional organizations that, that certifies the quality of a laboratory. So that's either typically the College of American Pathologists or the Joint Commission. So if you're someone who's walking into a clinic, how do you find out about the training? Can you tell us like, how is a patient supposed to know that kind of stuff or know what questions to ask? What should they ask? Yeah, so I think patients are well within their rights to ask their physicians and the training of the lab staff. So one of the things that you might want to know, let's say you're having some specialty procedures that's outside of the normal workflow of an IVF cycle. And that could be anything from your husband is getting a TESI or a TESA or a PESA or a MESA to a special OSA activation protocol that's needed or another uh, PICSI perhaps for selecting sperm for an ICSI procedure or using a Zymot separation chip, and you are wanting some of these specialty items um, to be put into your IVF cycle. So I think you're well within your rights to ask about the training of a staff member, how much experience they have, how long the staff have been working there. You wanna know if there's a lot of staff turnover, and um, you also wanna know how many of those procedures your lab performs each year, or maybe each month. And what if they're not going to tell it, like, what can someone do if they're not going to get those? What if the doctor says, well, I'm not going to tell you, or do you think that that could be an issue? I would be uncomfortable with a lack of transparency. I think if you have staff that's been there for 20 years and is highly experienced in all processes, you're going to be very open about that. Whereas if maybe your IVF lab has some turnover, some churn, and you're, you're not keeping your experienced staff there, that can say a lot about an IVF lab, right? That's great advice. I agree. I I couldn't agree more. And what about technology? So, I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about like a lot of the 
the things that my patients do for work and I don't know the tools that they use, how would a patient know what questions to ask as far as whether a lab has the best technology in that so-called black box that you described? Yeah. So some of the things that I think patients could ask about are, what are the software systems? Do you have an EMR? Do you have a patient portal? Some of those things, obviously, ART Compass is meant to address um, this app that we developed. But another factor that goes into that is electronic witnessing. And your patients might not know what electronic witnessing is, but it is when a digital barcode or scanner reader actually helps you to know that you are putting the right sperm together with the right egg when you're moving embryos from dish to dish, that is that patient's only dish and you're not putting it into another patient's dish. And you're thawing an embryo, it is the patient who you think that you're thawing. And it can really help to prevent some disasters from happening. Excellent. Another thing that's important is the use of a high-powered laser in an IVF lab. So there are a lot of different protocols for handling embryos and for doing assisted hatching and for doing biopsy. We think now that one of the important things is to, to perform some of those procedures with a high-powered laser. It works quicker, it damages the embryo less, and it helps you get the embryos from the microscope back into the incubator fast. Um, another thing I like is for patients to each have their own incubator. So not, not incubating more than one patient's embryos together in the same space. Is so, really no, so no embryo bunk beds. That's right. No embryo bunk beds. <laughs> We really, we really want to prevent sleepovers, <laughs> the time of COVID and always. <laughs> and what about like the level of oxygen in the incubator and stuff like that, that some patients might read online? Are those kinds of things important? Yeah, so they are important and they're very important to embryologists. It is part of our job to maintain an environment that embryos can be grown in. And what we're trying to do is replicate a human fallopian tube. So the environment is very specialized. The air has to be very clean. The pH has to be tightly regulated. And the temperature and the humidity are also very important too. So we are monitoring hundreds of environmental points every day and trying to have our finger on the pulse of all of those. And what high-tech labs are starting to turn to now, I wouldn't expect this as a patient, but I, I would really like it if I went to a lab and they had what is called an Internet of Things monitoring system. So a lot of the monitoring that we do in an IVF lab is typically brute force. You walk to the incubator, you look at the levels, you measure it on the outside, you measure it on the inside, but it, it's really neat to have a web of sensors that can be monitoring that all day and all night after we wrap it up for the day and go home. Great. So you also mentioned certifications. So what certifications specifically should a very well-informed patient ask their doctor about that their lab has? Yeah. Well, I hope that when you walk through the halls, you pass by a, cert a certificate on the wall from the CAP or from JCO. Uh, the Joint Commission or the College of American Pathologists. So we are required to display our certifications and the lab is either in the pro, if it's a brand new lab, it might be in the process of gaining that certification. But there's also a notice that you can put on the wall that says this lab is seeking accreditation by a cap. And so you do want to see the actual certificate. And there's a set of regulations that governs the quality of an IVF lab and a medical um, uh, IVF lab. It's called CLIA 88. And those are the rules and regulations that both CAP and JCO are making sure that we follow. And so it, they are really responsible for us sort of policing our own quality inside of an IVF lab. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, makes perfect sense. Thank you. So the three things that people need to know about as far as how to pick the best IVF lab, basically from your expert guidance here, is training, technology, and certifications. That's right. Awesome. Well, thank you for giving us all this awesome information. I'm going to turn this interview into an article for patients to read. You can find it on my website, my blog section. You can find it on YouTube, Facebook. We're always going to take 
all the content that we create and link it up to the articles so patients can just print them out, read them on their own time. And then people can also find you on Instagram. Can you just let us know what your Instagram handle is again? That's right. So uh, you can connect with me personally. I'm Dr. Curly Cues. Um, Cues is spelled the French way, Q-U-E-U-E-S. And also at Art Compass IVF. Awesome. Well, thanks, Carol, for being on. We really appreciate you and hope you'll come back again. Thank you. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadine. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 